Alva Club of California welcomes to its distinguished forum Dwight D. Eisenhower, President of the United States of America. <laughs> this happy occasion preserves unbroken a tradition which began with President Theodore Roosevelt. The great and the near great have addressed this audience, but tonight we welcome the man whom history will record as preeminent among world leaders in the hour of greatest need. I have in mind the rapid succession of communist aggressions as millions of people were enveloped behind the far-reaching Iron Curtains. 
I have in mind the stalemate of futility in Korea, the rampaging inflation in our homeland, which was eating up the savings of the thrifty and throttling the motors of our free enterprise economy. Here then is the man trained in war who will be acclaimed by future generations as the man who laid the foundations of peace. And more, he is our present, whom we love with a deep and abiding affection. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, which put together today's program. Along with the staff at the Commonwealth Club, uh, the tech staff that's helping to put together all these online programs. We've done really dozens and dozens of them since the COVID crisis began. Um, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Susan Eisenhower, who's here with us today. She's the granddaughter of President Eisenhower, and she's written a great book, How Ike Led. Um, it's, it's like a... Uh, U2 spy plane overview of his whole, the principles that, that uh, led his presidency, but with a little, a, a young girl's uh, point of view on the man himself, and it's really quite a combination, and it, it's, it's a nice combination because it's, it also is the combination that you lived your life at, Susan, because you're, you're a political analyst, etc. you've lived your life this way, but in addition to that, you, you knew him personally for many, many years. I, I thought that was interesting, you made it all, he, he didn't uh, pass away until you were already in college or around that age, right? Yes. So, so uh, welcome everybody, and uh, we're going to get started to talk about President Eisenhower. For those of you who aren't familiar with the dates, he was president from 1953 until 1961. JFK was the president right afterwards, and he was the supreme allied commander um, during World War II. So, Susan, um, what, uh, first of all, thank you very much for joining us uh, from afar. Um, on our, you know, our online world that we've all recognized can happen very much more easily than we thought. Um, but tell, tell us a little bit about what inspired you to write the book. Because now this is, this is, you know, you've been working in this field for a long time as, as a, a political consultant, etc., and advisor, uh, and, and you decided to write about your own grandfather's work. It must have been very interesting to try to be objective and, and, and subjective at the same time. You did it successfully, but it, it, it can't have been easy. Well, uh, George, first of all, let me thank you so much for the opportunity to be back at the Commonwealth Club. Uh, I had the wonderful opportunity of presenting two of my other books at the club in years past, so it's great to be back and to talk about this. And yes, I think the, the question is uh, a very interesting one. Maybe as part of the disclaimer for uh, our discussion this evening, I should say that as a kid, I was really raised to compartmentalize uh, what I uh, knew about his politics, uh, about uh, the period in which he governed, um, about the issues that he dealt with. Um, and on the other side, uh, my relationship with him as a grandparent. Mm -hmm. So this book is really a marriage of those two things, as you said, and it was really quite an experience for me to put it together in one place because uh, I was continually struck by how we were doing certain things as a family as some of the, he was dealing with some of these crises. So that was interesting. The impetus for why to do it now revolved around uh, three events, I guess. So one is that the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II, uh, mm -hmm. just, well, for, certainly uh, VJ Day is about to occur, but we had, of course, the 75th anniversary of the end of the war in Europe mm -hmm. um, back in May of this year. Um, secondly, uh, the Eisenhower Memorial in Washington, D.C. Uh, will be 
uh, dedicated on September um, September 17th in a uh, much more um, scaled back version of its original self, but mm -hmm. it will nevertheless be open to the public after that date. And then finally, uh, we're going into an election year, and uh, there's always a lot of thinking about uh, the presidency as uh, the most important four-year election mm -hmm. uh, occurs. And so I thought that um, Ike had something to say to us today. And I, th I guess that's the reason I put it together. Well, he really did. And I, I found that, I mean, obviously you, you took it from that angle, but there were so many different elements that were so interesting today. Uh, one of I mean, as applicable, one of them that I thought, it's just a small side uh, tangent, but that there were people who said in 1956 uh, that were against him being reelected, saying, well, you're going to actually be, be electing Richard Nixon. You're not going to be electing Eisenhower because Eisenhower is sick. He just had these heart attacks and so on. And so pretty soon Richard Nixon's going to be the president. The same thing is going on today uh, in the Democratic Party. People are saying, uh, you know, Biden will never be president for more than a month or two. So you're really uh, electing Kamala Harris. So I, I found it interesting that that get, keeps getting thrown out at people. <laughs> well, of course, um, I'm not going to speculate on whether there's a difference in approach. Uh, but Eisenhower was very conscious of what it would be to be a diminished president. Mm -hmm. We have to remember that President Wilson, there was a, really almost a scandal that uh, people in the country didn't know how ill that president was. Mm -hmm. So Ike was determined not to find himself in that situation for the good of the country. And after uh, he had three illnesses during his presidency, and after each one of them, he would give himself a very arduous test like a round-the-world trip or a trip to Europe that required lots of meetings and lots of stress. And he'd always tell his advisors, if I, if I don't perform at top level, uh, you have to tell me because then I'll resign. Uh, <clears throat> in any case, that, that never happened. He uh, became actually uh, rather uh, adroit at managing his time, managing his stress, and, um, and generally, um, you know, positioning himself uh, to get through his, his uh, second term. It was interesting, also a small tangent, but, uh, but uh, that he, the doctors lied to him about uh, the, uh, I think the <laughs> ileum thing so that he didn't think it was as serious so that he, and he kind of thought he might have made a different decision in 56 if, he, if they had warned him about it. I, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, one of the biggest decisions about uh, rerun, uh, running for a second term, as you point out, is that he'd had a heart attack in 1955. And uh, he had a doctor named General uh, Howard Snyder. Mm -hmm. And although they were devoted friends and they'd been together in one form or another since the war, uh, Howard Snyder actually drove um, Grandad up the wall. <laughs> uh, because first of all, uh, he hovered. Um, he uh, came up with all sorts of things Eisenhower wasn't allowed to do, including uh, watching the Army-Navy football game in real time <laughs> because uh, Howard Snyder decided it was going to raise uh, the president's blood pressure. Uh, you know, like, uh, I, I really, Ike really did care about the outcome of that game, by the way. Um, and, and so it was. I think Howard Snyder was part of the team that kind of wasn't actually really very direct uh, with uh, the president about his um, ileitis situation. Mm -hmm. And again, back to your earlier question, uh, Ike was not going to be a diminished president. Yeah. And, and so he might well have decided differently. But I think he really, you know, at the end of the day, my grandmother intervened for the first time, I think, um, since the early part of their marriage and encouraged him to run again because she thought that uh, he would probably die of another heart attack watching everything from the sidelines. <laughs> you know, that's a that's a you tough decision. Watch out for that high blood pressure. <laughs> well, I, I it's it's I find it interesting the way your grandmother's decision was much more easy to understand. The doctor's decision. Was, this is the guy who's making all these decisions about the war in Korea and about this. And about, I mean, all these big decisions, and you're worried about him watching a football game, I, even if he takes it too seriously. Um, it, it seemed a little bit ludicrous. <laughs> well, I, I told that story in the book in the context of how an extraordinary amount of power, how that often warps uh, the relationships you have with other people. It doesn't exactly, yeah. make, uh, mean that it makes them... Um, terrible, but it does it does change things. And and the doctors, for some reason, um, 
I love this expression, actually tried to handle this man, which would only make him more wound up, I'm sure, because mm. he was a guy who was used to making big decisions and was perfectly capable uh, of facing any difficult news. As a matter of fact, in his last years of life, uh, I saw this so often, how, how brave he was and how ready he was to take uh, whatever was coming. As a matter of fact, he even volunteered for some uh, rather exotic treatments for his condition mm -hmm. because he thought it might help people after he was gone. Mm -hmm. But um, this wasn't anybody you weren't straightforward with. I just want to say that for the record. <laughs> yeah, and I, it's, it's a good uh, transition because you, you, before we get to the, the, the big issues that he faced, I think it'd be good to talk about these personal relationships that he had, um, the friendships that he had, the people that kept him grounded, his family, and, and your own relationship with him. And, and you have some pictures to show, um, which, which include uh, some pictures of yourself with him uh, when you were younger. So we'll, we'll get those up on the screen. Okay, so there's, there's the picture we've been showing. Um, this is him at right around the end of World War II, right? Yes, um, this picture was taken in 1945. Uh, by that time, uh, he had his fifth star. And uh, I think it's a lovely picture. I think he looks tired, though. I don't know if you'd agree, but mm -hmm. he, looks, he looks content. Mm -hmm. uh, if the picture were um, full length, uh, you would see that he's wearing only a single bar of ribbons and five stars on his shoulder. Mm -hmm. uh, he was not one to walk around like a Soviet general with uh, medals that went all the way down to their waist. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I like this picture because I, I think he looks, uh, he looks approachable, mm -hmm. though I would say tired. And that's got to be a fairly accurate assessment since yeah. it's impossible to know how you could be working, uh, you know, 100 hours a week or 130 hours a week sometimes up all night, up in the middle of the night. Um, and not come out of a three-year stint like that really, uh, you know, deeply tired. And, and uh, in 45, how old was he? He was born in... in the uh, he was born in uh, 1890. 1890. So he would have been 50, 55 years old. As a matter of fact, if you look at pictures, um, while when he was president of Columbia University, he actually looks younger than he does uh, in that picture, even though it was... Uh, um, you know, it was another five years later. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, he gave a lot of energy. So the next picture is uh, a picture of you. Oh. <laughs> and, and this is well, you as a, as a teenager with, with uh, him. And a horse, right? Oh, yes. Is there a horse in that picture? I can't see it from here, but... Um, Seems like there's a back oh, of a horse. Oh, no, perfect. Maybe not. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, I became an amateur photographer, and uh, we have in our family collections, all sorts of these homemade things. Mm -hmm. What I like about that picture is somebody else took um, a picture of Ike taking a picture of me. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, every time I see this picture, it makes me smile because of this bald head of his that my grandmother always said she loved to, you know, um, roll over at night in bed and, you know, pat his little bald head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Yeah. If there's a horse in the picture, and as um, from this stand standpoint, I can't quite see it, but yeah. uh, I was the family horseback rider, mm -hmm. um, and so this was a, a bond we had because he loved horses. And they were the only animals on his farm that he indulged in any way, shape, or form. Uh -huh. um, uh, you know, he was uh, cattle were cattle, and um, and he certainly didn't like barnyard cats, but. He loved these horses, and so I think it's a rather sweet picture. And you have a, a, a short story in your book about when you were around 11 and the horses got away and he had just put in a putting green, um, his special putting green. You might tell that story because I think it also well, shows your relationship nicely. Well, um, I think the story says a lot about Ike's compassion and my lifetime guilt because he just put in a, a putting green and he put the putting green in because he wanted to have some privacy while he practiced his putting. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, he'd ha have had to have gone to the Gettysburg Country Club, mm -hmm. which he enjoyed doing and seeing people. But, you know, th there wasn't actually any privacy in those events. People came out to watch him golf and the rest of it. So uh, one evening I was... Uh, padlocking uh, a gate and five of the horses on the farm pushed against the gate sort of almost knocked me over and then went running all around um, the uh, the lawn in front of my parents grandparents uh, sitting area where they always sat in the evening 
And all five of these horses are running around like crazy and circling here and going there and then made a huge sweep across his golf green. Hmm. And I was um, more than in a state of panic. Uh, everybody came out of the fields, field hands, secret service, everybody. And we were trying to ra- round up these animals. We finally did. And then I had to go in and face some music. Mm-hmm. And not only had they ruined my grandfather's golf green, but I was late for dinner. So this was, um, <laughs> this was one of those moments in childhood that you don't forget. So I, I walked in. He always sat in a swivel chair and he swiveled around and he looked at me and he said, you know what I said to your grandmother? Wow, I haven't seen horses run like that since I was a kid in Abilene, Kansas. <laughs> and of course, I apologized after that. But I, I never heard of it again, and and it was a very smart move on his part mm-hmm. because um, the guilt would be lingering, <laughs> and I was careful <laughs> never to make a mistake like that again. But he was very nice not to bring it up or to hold it against me or hold it over my head because I think he knew I was devastated and wouldn't do it again. <laughs> it's one of those classic experiences that that you know is in a Disney cartoon for children. You know that the child makes that mistake, you know, of, of irresponsibility, and and then. Yes. You know, in, in, in the ones where, where the parents are good, they do what, what Ike did. And where they're bad, they, they, they look like a witch. <laughs> so. Well, George, I'd add one more thing is that mm-hmm. I had the great good sense to apologize profusely and to take full responsibility. And I think <laughs> that went down very well. I, I, <laughs> I fear I would have had a uh, significant uh, ongoing lecture about uh, personal accountability had I not done so. <laughs> but you'd already learned that lesson, I'll bet. Yeah, I'd learned that one already. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so here he is. He's painting a picture. I assume, I assume that you're in that picture. But yes, here's it's a painter. Actually, you can see from the, the postcard he's painting from uh-huh. the photograph that it's my mother and um, three of my four siblings. My youngest sister was born uh, in 1955 after uh, that, that portrait was painted. But um, it, it was taken at Camp David, and I guess one of the... Um, helpers at Camp David came in and took a, a picture of him doing that. But, he, you know, he took up uh, painting, actually, after the war. Uh, he sort of followed Winston Churchill's example. Uh, he was intrigued by uh, how much painting the prime minister did while he was trying to get his head together. Mm-hmm. And then also um, his own portrait painter uh, gave him some uh, uh, oil paints as a present, and I took it up then, and then became really very attached to this pastime because he found it it centered him, Mm -hmm. and while he was concentrating on the painting, he was allowing his mind to work through some very difficult problems. Yeah, and you you, you have a a short story in the book about how he had an exhibit at an art museum, and he told, you know, somebody that there's only one reason that they're being shown here, and that's because I was president. (laughs) Right. He yeah, they, he, I'd know, they'd never give a guy like me an ex- exhibit for paintings that look like this. Well, exactly. He was very modest, unlike yeah. Churchill, who really um, took his paintings so seriously that he wanted to be regarded almost as a professional. Mm-hmm. Um, Ike did it to uh, give away his gifts, and mm-hmm. um, he gave uh, his cabinet members paintings of them. Uh, he painted all of his wartime colleagues. Uh, he actually even painted uh, Prince Charles and Princess Anne for the Queen of England, mm-hmm. and always with full apologies about their execution. But actually, he had some talent, I think. Yeah, we have a picture here I, of, of, what he, yeah, of what he did with Churchill's. Uh, he, the, the picture of Churchill. That's the next picture, yeah. It's, it's quite talented. It's not, you know, it's not amateur. Not, not bad. Yeah. And, and. The other charming thing about um, this painting is that uh, he actually was able to present it to uh, Prime Minister Churchill when Churchill, um, he just stepped down, but he was visiting uh, in the United States. And there is a wonderful picture of Churchill sort of looking it over like, uh, um, you know, Churchill the painter would. Um, (laughs) Actually, um, Ike Ike also painted um, Field Marshal... uh, Bernard Law Montgomery, who mm-hmm. was um, one of his, um, one of the big Brandon personalities me. he worked with during World War II. And it's a lovely, lovely painting that hangs today uh, in the British Embassy in Washington, D.C. Huh. So you, you, you said it's one of, one of his interesting personalities. He's sort of a frenemy, as they would call him now, right? He's, <laughs> Something like that. They, they got along, but they were <laughs> enemies too. So and the next picture is one that he gave to you, the next painting. Yeah, there's a little story with this one, right? 
Yeah, there's a there's a story about this one. I um, I often stood behind him uh, when he was at the easel. He had a in addition to his retirement years, uh, he always insisted on having a, a studio somewhere nearby. So in the White House, it was on the second floor overlooking Lafayette Park. Mm -hmm. um, and it was around that time that I was standing behind him admiring his work. Now, this is a landscape. I don't know um, what the scene is, but as I said before, he uh, painted uh, usually from postcards. And they were these landscapes he did were always serene. Uh, and it's been noted that um, there's something ironic about it because probably every brushstroke is full of some kind of um, turbulence he's trying to uh, make sense of. This painting at the bottom is dated DE 1957. Um, and in 1957, um, many things happened, but I was intrigued when I looked at the back of it that it says to Susan 1958. Mm -hmm. So that means it's likely a painting that was done, uh, first of all, during the Little Rock crisis, uh, when Eisenhower sent the 101st Airborne Division to desegregate uh, Little Rock High School and to escort nine African Americans um, uh, to start school in that September. Um, and then right after that, of course, was Sputnik uh, and the Soviet Union uh, launched its first artificial satellite, or I should say the world's first artificial satellite into space. So I look at this painting and I think, wow, they're, those brush, brush strokes uh, must have um, you know, provided some relief during that, those times of um, great controversy and crisis. Well, we're going to go back uh, to, to that. I mean, people talk about October surprises. And uh, I mean, in 1956, uh, <laughs> your, you know, your grandfather certainly got two really huge ones. But uh, we'll, let's finish the, the pictures and then we'll go. And uh, by the way, uh, for the audience, uh, if you have any questions, just send them in uh, through the chat room. Um, and uh, we'll ask them tonight. We got yours, Gary, and I'll, we'll get to the Korean conflict uh, a little bit later. So uh, next picture is, yes, and that's you, right? That's me. Yeah. Well, I, I look like I'm terribly thoughtful, and he looks very kind. And I, I like that picture because I, I want, I've always wanted people to know uh, that uh, he had some very, very tough decisions in some very dark times uh, during our history. When you think about what he saw and what mm -hmm. he had to order during the war. Uh, but you know, he never became hard or cynical. And mm -hmm. um, I think as both a family member and as an analyst, I, I think it's remarkable. It's, it says a lot about his character. It seems to me one of the hardest things to do to, to make those decisions, we'll get, we'll get to D-Day later, to, to know that at the best, so many people will die. And at the worst, you know, you don't even succeed at what you're trying to accomplish and even more people will die. Uh, the right. people who, who've made those decisions for us, I think is why uh, they get admired for decades and, and even centuries to come because it's so crucial. Um, and your grandfather is certainly one of those. Uh, the next picture, we have a couple of pictures of him, I think now. Uh, here's a picture of him as a young man on a, on a baseball team, just so that you can see him before he's bald, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. I, I was looking, um, I, it's always fun to see Ike with a full head of hair. So he is, um, George, maybe you could describe which one he is, because I'm not sure that. Uh, I think this is him right here. Yeah. That's exactly right. Okay. Um, he was, uh, this is the Abilene High School, and he was on the baseball team. He was a very good baseball player, but uh, I think his real passion was football. Mm -hmm. And he uh, lost his lost his way for a little while when he uh, broke his knee and was unable to continue playing football at West Point because he uh, he had played against uh, Jim Thorpe, as a matter of fact, mm. uh, in the Army versus Carlisle game. And he was um, regarded as a very fast, uh, effective football player. And uh, that uh, was very discouraging for him. And um, he had to learn how to snap out of that downer. After taking up cigarettes, of course. <laughs> well, there's a one one tangent. I uh, wasn't planning on going there, but I thought it was interesting that you mentioned uh, that all leaders aren't people who just have obeyed their whole time. That he was he was kind of a, a, a not a bad boy, but he certainly got himself in trouble when he was at West Point, and he didn't even go there to become a soldier. He just got went there for the free education. Another another very interesting tangent. Well, he shared that with Ulysses S. Grant. A, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, great leaders turned out to be. 
um, civilians who had never imagined themselves as soldiers. Mm -hmm. I think, George, one thing that's uh, worth mentioning, especially in the context of West Point, is that he grew up in a very religious household. Mm -hmm. um, and the Eisenhowers were pacifists. They were uh, God-fearing pacifists. There wasn't an, uh, an Eisenhower who fought in the Civil War, though they named um, Ike's uh, uncle uh, Abraham Lincoln Eisenhower because they wanted to express their views. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but they were uh, they were conscientious objectors. So you can imagine the um, you know the family feelings when Ike goes off to West Point because uh, he can't wait any longer for his younger brothers to put him through college. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating. And, and those want more details, it's in the book. Uh, the next picture is meeting with Khrushchev, which was a very, it, your, your grandfather had a very interesting idea. I mean, you mentioned it, we, we were talking about it earlier. Um, and, and I don't think very many people know about this, but he, he was, when he was talking about the distinctions between what was going on during the Cold War, it wasn't a matter of capitalism versus socialism or even communism. It was. Oh, yes. He says, actually, in the, uh, the speech to the Commonwealth Club, mm -hmm. that it's really about, um, it's, it's really about um, uh, openness, um, uh, democracy versus authoritarianism. Mm -hmm. And then he goes on to say it's about, um, it's about a free and open society as opposed to a closed and secretive society. And I, I just thought that was um, rather intriguing. Yeah, because it's a lot of times in order to fight the enemy that's perceived, you become like the enemy uh, in, in closing off and becoming secretive yourself sometimes. But and I, it's, well, it's interesting. Well, George, if I could add two things about, sorry, sure. if I could add um, something here about this picture. Um, this is in 1959, and even though they're smiling, mm -hmm. uh, the United States at this point has been thrown into. Uh, what is called the Berlin Ultimatum. So uh, Nikita Khrushchev is currently threatening the United States mm -hmm. um, with uh, punitive action uh, over Berlin. And if it had turned into war, there would be no way to defend Berlin uh, with conventional weapons. So it might have turned nuclear. Mm -hmm. So today we have those kinds of standoffs. But Eisenhower actually uh, invited Khrushchev to come to the United States. And Khrushchev was here for 10 days, 10 days. Um, and during that time, uh, the Soviet premier was subjected to Eisenhower's grandchildren as a way to soften him up. <laughs> and, all, and all I can say is that the future of the world hung in the balance as to whether or not we were going to be well behaved that afternoon. <laughs> uh, we, we apparently managed to, uh, save the world for the first and last time. <laughs> no, I shouldn't make jokes about this. It was a very serious time. Oh, yeah. but, um, the, those, after those... the trip, the, the Soviets did lift the ultimatum mm -hmm. um, with some agreement to continue to talk about it at uh, a summit in Paris. So we'll talk about the U2 uh, right now, as long as we've got Khrushchev on the screen too. Uh, um, we're going to do it later, but let me do it right now. So there's this U2 incident that, that's famous. But what's also very fascinating about what you said is how much information uh, President Eisenhower had about what the Russians uh, actually had done and what they hadn't, and that he knew that everybody was lying about the missile gap and, 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 and this other stuff that was driving the Cold War. It was perfectly clear that they did not have a force that we needed to worry about at that time when that was going on because they had the information. So uh, maybe maybe say a little bit about what happened. Well, it's all intriguing, and actually Sputnik is tied up in this because right. um, you know we just had the um, the dawn of the space age during his administration, and there were no rules for outer space at all. Uh, it was undecided legally whether or not. Uh, sovereign airspace would extend all the way out into outer space. Um, and so through a, an agreement with the Soviet Union, the United States and the Soviet Union agreed to launch artificial satellites in 1957. So to the Eisenhower administration, there was no surprise about that. Mm -hmm. uh, the point of, of uh, free access to space, which is what uh, Eisenhower um, strongly endorsed and, and, and had to make it possible for the use of the free use of satellites in orbit. Mm -hmm. And the reason those satellites were so important to Eisenhower is because it would help avert a surprise attack. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and before the satellites could get, uh, be, be launched, 
uh, into free access of space. Um, they, you know, he wanted he proposed overflights for the United States and the Soviet Union to fly their aircraft over each uh, country's uh, territory to assure that there would not be a surprise nuclear attack. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, I just have to say about the Sputnik thing, uh, the administration knew they were going to launch their sat- satellites and didn't even feel very badly. Um, as a matter of fact, sort of encouraged the Soviets to go first behind mm-hmm. the scenes without without telling them anything. But mm-hmm. they were sort of um, hoping that the Soviet Union would go first so that the Soviet Union would accidentally um, establish the precedent for free use of outer space. Mm-hmm. So not long after that, uh, the satellites we had been working on, um, the Corona project, um, got launched. And we could tell from space and from the U-2 exactly what the, um, not, I should say, quite precisely uh, what the Soviet military buildup looked like, mm-hmm. including the number of rockets they had. Nevertheless, Sputnik opened the way uh, for opposition to the Eisenhower administration and preparation for the 1960 presidential campaign yes. uh, turned into a scandal, which is known as the missile gap. And uh, the Democrats were accusing the Eisenhower administration um, of failing to keep up with the huge lead the Soviet Union allegedly had um, in uh, rockets and uh, uh, you know, nuclear weapons and that kind of thing. Um, it turned out to be a fiction. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was, we were way ahead of the Soviet Union. Um, and the only way we could eventually tell that were by the two programs that Eisenhower initiated, the U-2, um, and also the satellite program um, for reconnaissance purposes. Yeah, your version of the story made me think they must, he must have had some pretty good lawyers on his team advising, well, if you do it this way then and let the Soviets go first, then this is going to set the precedent that's going to allow us to get what we want, which is this free and open space thing. And if we go first, they'll say, we're trying to dominate and then they'll, it won't work. So. Well, we had a hint, too, because we had uh, proposed uh, the Open Skies Treaty in, uh, at the Geneva uh, Summit in, in 55, and the Soviet Re- uh, Union absolutely rejected it. Mm-hmm. I mean, they would have had overflights over the United States, mm-hmm. but they didn't want this mutual overflight business because they thought we were going to use it for targeting purposes. Mm-hmm. So you can imagine that if we'd gone into space first, um, they would well have accused us. Mm-hmm. Um, of going into space for doing what uh, you know the U two is meant to do, mm-hmm. it's it's sort of a complicated story, but it's what I call playing the long game. Mm-hmm. It took a big political hit, mm-hmm. um, but when um, Sputnik went up before any of our successful satellites, which were, or, I'm sorry, our successful um, artificial satellites, um, but in the end, it was what began to establish a, a framework for space, which allows. Uh, allowed all of the tremendous amount of development uh, to take place without conflict. Well, he was the right man in the right place because he certainly had the long game in his mind a lot, uh, and and he had plenty of experience with it. The other thing that was very interesting, uh, also tangential about your book, was that because he had so much dealing with the Russians uh, during World War II and so on and so forth, Mm -hmm. that he he was in a very good position to to have a realistic idea about what they were up to and, and what they would do and what they wouldn't do. Um, and he did not consider them so fanatic that they would destroy themselves, that they were, that they were somewhat rational players. Yeah, my father had a tremendous sense of humor, I must say. Uh, I asked him what he thought was one of the biggest um, uh, intelligence conclusions of the 1950s. And my late father said that the, Soviet, that the Soviets were not early Christian martyrs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, in other words, the assessment was is that uh, the Soviet leadership wanted to stay in power. Um, And so, you know, that's a very big difference between um, wanting to launch a preemptive strike. Right. Uh, uh, That's a big analytical difference. Um, Big. Uh, Well, you just mentioned your father. Great story about the conversation he had with President Eisenhower, his father, about Korea. He wanted to go to Korea. He wanted to go back with his troops to Korea. And, and that's pretty serious. You didn't find out about that when you were young. I assume you found that out later. Did you find it out when your father was still alive or did you Oh, read yes. It? yes. Yes. Oh, yes. okay. The, the, uh, George, the story, uh, to, to summarize it, is um, when uh, General Eisenhower becomes President Eisenhower. Now he's not uh, um, just a five-star general. As a matter of fact, he um, 
he gave up his army commission mm -hmm. to run for president because we don't have generals as president of the United States. Mm -hmm. um, so he suddenly is the commander in chief and he is my father, who, uh, who was a graduate of West Point too, uh, an army officer who was uh, stationed in Korea, mm -hmm. comes back for his father's inauguration. And then they have a very serious talk. Mm -hmm. And Ike says, you have to decide whether you're going to go back to your unit in Korea or I, I'll command you to stay in the United States. But here's the deal. If, if you go back to Korea, uh, you need to carry a handgun with you at all times. Uh, and you have to promise me, promise me, this is an order, promise me that you will never be taken as a hostage uh, or be in a situation where you could put the president of the United States in any jeopardy. Um, so, uh, what that really adds up to is mm -hmm. that my father agreed to commit suicide, mm -hmm. uh, if he were in a situation where he was going to be taken hostage. Um, and it sounds like a really, uh, by that time, my father um, and mother already had three kids. I was the third of that group. Mm -hmm. Um, as I say, my sister Mary came along in 1955. So this is several years before. And, you know, it's kind of stunning today. Um, we think actually that our leaders ought to be sending their kids overseas, but, the potential for blackmail mm -hmm. and to put the president of the United States in a, in a position uh, that would undermine the security of the United States was unacceptable for those two army officers. And my father agreed. Mm -hmm. um, thankfully, um, he lived to the age of 91. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, he came home from Korea without, uh, uh, without having to take such a drastic and tragic step. It's such a telling detail about the difference, I think, in time and place and what, what they had already gone through with the Depression and the war, that this father and son can make this deal and both understood that that's, all, that's the only thing that you could do. Well, and yeah. also, um, they were both military men, and it's, right. called, doing your it's called doing your duty. Right. Um, because the mission uh, always supersedes any individual um, desires or... Mm -hmm. uh, however you'd like to put it. And uh, I think it is moving. I, I sort of think that story is important too, because to, to understand Dwight Eisenhower is to understand that uh, he was trained as a military mind. He was a strategic leader. He was um, somebody who was highly self-disciplined. Mm -hmm. He didn't like histrionics. He didn't like uh, over-emotionalism. Uh, he believed in um, self-discipline and process. And process for him was extremely important because he didn't want his subordinates out freelancing, and he certainly didn't want to make any um, impetuous, uninformed decision. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is all training that comes out of um, you know a lifelong experience in the military, especially at the highest levels. You have great stories about uh, how he dealt with the whole uh, atomic weaponry issue and everything, making three different commissions. He, he kind of did it in this very elaborate way. Um, but uh, let's... Let's move on to the next question, uh, the next picture. And yeah, so here he is talking to the soldiers. You have several great stories, not only at the time during World War II, but afterwards, 10 years afterwards, I think the 82nd uh, Airborne, he met with them and he had met with them. I think this is the group that he's meeting with now on their way off to fly. And I think it's, it's interesting because I don't think people realize how personal he made this um, and how, how difficult that must have been to do that, to look him in the face. Well, yeah, well, this is uh, this picture is taken on uh, June fifth, just as these paratroopers are about to uh, take off to the Normandy coast um, to unknown fates. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason uh, I think this particular picture is so wonderful is look at his face and how he's smiling at those boys. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's um, particularly noteworthy because. Uh, the airborne drop, his decision about the airborne drop was probably one of those, the toughest of that whole uh, Normandy enterprise. And, and the reason for it is, is rather simple. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, his his um, technical expert, um, Air Marshal Trafford Lee Mallory, a British Air Marshal, who was responsible for the 24,000 paratroopers who dropped, uh, warned Ike about uh, General Eisenhower about um, a week before the D-Day uh, assault was to take place that he thought that the paratroopers uh, should be canceled because the Germans had reinforced a position um, and he thought it was dangerous and that uh, between 50 and 70 percent of 
uh, paratroopers and glider um, troops uh, would be lost in this exercise. Mm -hmm. um, so I um, went into a room for two hours and uh, decided against that recommendation because mm -hmm. the paratroopers were central uh, for opening a number of pathways off um, Utah and Omaha Beach. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what's moving about this picture is that um, having made that decision a week earlier and having written a note for his pocket that says, if the, the landings fail, the responsibility is mine and mine alone. Mm -hmm. He goes out and he looks these paratroopers in the eyes, mm -hmm. um, thinking in his mind that his technical expert says between 50 and 70% Mm -hmm. of these boys are not coming home yeah um yeah i thought it was there was another thing i think you you detail is the fact that the original d-day plans uh when he got his hands on them he changed them and increased double double the size of the uh, invasion and, and added this plan about the paratroopers landing um and fortunately the advisor wasn't right that it, it was uh four percent that died and ten percent were wounded or something like that still a high amount but but not not at all what he was and they succeeded and everyone assumed that without that uh the overall uh it could have been an overall disaster i mean everyone that's knew right well they were the paratroopers were the linchpin of the operation. Mm -hmm. Now, I can tell you pretty much what Eisenhower was saying at that point, and mm -hmm. it's because we know it, that uh, that is the 101st Airborne. Mm -hmm. um, we know it because a, a number of them came back and told us what was being talked about. Mm -hmm. um, and he was asking them about home. Mm -hmm. He wasn't giving them a pep talk about getting on a plane and you know dropping uh, behind lines in Normandy. He was talking to them about home. Mm -hmm. And I, I once asked my father, why would he do that? I mean, uh, and <laughs> my father, military officer, says, well, they knew what they were about to go do, and they were probably scared half to death. Um, so imagine that smile mm -hmm. and a man who came out and had the courage to look them in the eyes before they took off. And they'd say, don't worry, General, we're going to whip Hitler. And, um, you know, a great exchange, really. Yeah. Uh, very moving. There are a lot of moving tales in your story um, of, of your grandfather. So uh, I think the next picture is uh, that's that's him at a D-Day uh, remembrance uh, years later. Do you know about how old he uh, was this at this is, time? Well, I'll tell you. Um, he would have been seven. Let's see, um, seventy-five. Mm -hmm. um, it was D-Day plus twenty years. Uh, mm -hmm. That picture was taken. Uh, he gave an interview to Walter Cronkite and they drove all through uh, the Normandy coastline. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, this is the American cemetery before it had been completely finished. Mm -hmm. um, it was a long process to put that cemetery together, but this was the first time I could come back. You know, during the presidency, the 10th anniversary of, of D-Day occurred in 1955 when he was president and he did not mm -hmm. want to politicize. Um, yeah you know, the, the, uh, what's really hallowed ground. Um, so he sent a, a gift to the people of Normandy and then spent the day in seclusion, but here he comes back and he's talking to Walter Cronkite, but look at, um, the pain in his face, mm -hmm. all, all of those, all of those kids who didn't make it. And he was responsible for the decisions that may have cost some of those people their lives. Mm -hmm. Um, so then Walter Cronkite says, you know, what do you, what do you think when you sit here? And I'm very moved by this. He, he said, they gave us another chance. And he says, the question is, what are we going to do with that chance? Mm -hmm. And I, in a way, think that we're at a crossroads today where we have to ask ourselves, what are we going to do with the chance we have by the time we move beyond this uh, crisis? Are we going to be a more united country uh, or are we going to allow our divisions to uh, separate us as a people. Mm -hmm. um, that's really a great segue. We have actually uh, uh, audio uh, of uh, President Eisenhower. Uh, he spoke at the Commonwealth Club here 60 years ago, and uh, as you know, and uh, I have a little clip, um, maybe about three minutes long, uh, where everybody can hear his voice. I know that a lot of people are not aware of it. It is not as, as uh, commonly heard as uh, President Kennedy's voice, for example, with the clips. 
But the way he says what he says is almost as important as what he says. And I think it's very relevant for today, just as you were saying. Um, so as soon as that clip uh, gets started, we'll, we'll listen to it. Um, but I, I find it uh, fascinating, as, as we were saying a little bit earlier, this uh, generation of men, I mean, you're, my father uh, was in the war. He went, uh, dropped off in North Africa, went up through uh, Italy and Sicily. No. Is it ready? Just go ahead and run it. Yeah. I'm glad, I'm glad to, be to be here, here this evening, evening to, to sustain, sustain your, your perfect score as having as a speaker every president of the United States since this club was founded at the beginning of the century. <laughs> I sincerely hope that my appearance gives you no reason to abandon the practice. <laughs> Moved by a wisdom developed out of experience, the organizer of this club devised for their new creation a noble and necessary purpose, better government in their state. Its, energi its energizing spark was the belief that and I take these words from the documents of the time, California suffers greatly because the best elements of the population fail to cooperate for the common good as effectively as the bad elements cooperate for evil purposes. The dedication of that group and the unremitting efforts of its membership to pursue the course of sound government have remained undimmed for the almost six decades of the club's existence. The word commonwealth signifies a group united by common interests. But equally significant is the fact that in the political realm, a commonwealth, as Mr. Webster defines it, has come to meet generally, if not always, an association based upon free choice. Tonight, I shall try to apply to some aspects of the world of international affairs the founding principle of this organization, that this state suffered because of the failure of some elements to cooperate as effectively for good as others did for evil. No group, no matter how well-intentioned, can cooperate fruitfully unless there is first established a firm basis of common understanding. This the founders of your club recognized by noting that one of the great difficulties was that different groups in California did not know each other. They were separated at that time by wide areas, and they also distrusted each other. Just as the California of 1903, the year your club was founded, was a far cry from the Commonwealth of California today, so the world, as we turned into the 20th century, is scarcely recognizable as the one we know in 1960. And the same issues are here, and as you said, um, can people cooperate? Uh, one of the big issues uh, that you uh, talked about in the book in several places is um, that your grandfather was really not either a Democrat or a Republican, uh, he was a, uh, and so he was a moderate, um, and he worked together quite often. In fact, in his cabinet he had Democrats, and so on, as, as used to be done. Um, and it, it seems to me uh, he was worried about the extremists uh, at both ends. And, and those extremists at the time, I mean, on the right, there was the John Birch Society, there was, there was the McCarthy anti-communist. On the left, there were the communists and, and, and people who were trying to help the Soviet Union uh, to succeed um, and, and, and other groups that were extreme. And he tried to run through the middle. And he was, uh, of course, uh, criticized for not moving fast enough by one group and criticized for going too fast by the other groups. Um, but he, he, he definitely went right up the middle. And I've, I've often thought uh, today, and it's, it's, it's interesting because 
It's almost like the Democrats and the Republicans, without knowing it, shot themselves in their own feet um, by, <laughs> by gerrymandering all of the uh, congressional districts. They did it not to cause what happened uh, back in the 80s, but they did it in order to ensure that they all got reelected. But what that did was it made the primary elections, the, pr the, the actual election, because their group was always going to win in their thing, as a result of which it pushed towards the extreme because the primaries work for extremists. And we could, we could undo that process. Um, I, I, and, and both parties, it seems to me, ought to be interested in that. But if they don't get interested in it, you, you, you could, we could use another President Eisenhower that said, what about getting the Democrats uh, that are moderate and the Republicans that are moderate to work together and, and, and do that instead, you know, that run something in the middle? Because people, and I think about 60% of the voters, it seems from the polling, are, are right in that situation. So uh, it's very interesting. I think that's the nice framework for all the different issues he, he covered. Uh, one of, uh, we have a couple of questions here, so we, there's plenty of things that we're going to cover. Uh, I mean, so many issues that he did. It. But uh, let's um, ask the questions that were asked, like um, Gary Landsman asked, what was Ike's strategy to prevent a flare-up of the Korean conflict? So there was, there was a stalemate going on in Korea, um, and he came in as a general, and a lot of people thought, well, he'll win the war for us, but that's not how he went about doing it. Um, because he's very realistic about that, about uh, the Iron Curtain countries, and maybe you can talk a little bit about how he, he, he dealt with that. Well, of course, um, it's, it's a long story. They always are. <laughs> yeah. But I think if you were to look at his, uh, well, let me start by saying that after he was elected president, uh, he went to Korea, as he promised during the campaign, uh, and he actually took a helicopter ride over the terrain. He got pretty close to the front, as a matter of fact, if he wasn't right on the front, which I would have thought was rather dangerous for a newly elected uh, president. But he wanted to see he wanted to see the terrain. Mm -hmm. He wanted to see the lay of the land firsthand. Uh, I think the terrain already um, worried him a lot, especially given the positions of um, the uh, both sides. And he thought that this is just not a winnable war. Mm -hmm. um, unless you know, it becomes a big war and big weapons are used. He just didn't think it was going to succeed. And he was very much against wars without an end that would bleed uh, not just um, human lives, but it would uh, bleed the economy and it would bleed energy and attention. Um, and he um, set about, um, you know, working out uh, negotiations that led to the armistice. But um, this later became a great point of contention, as you know, between um, those who uh, were in favor of um, making <laughs> the world safe for America to engage in small wars mm -hmm. uh, versus uh, Eisenhower's view that um, small wars start small, but can get big. Mm -hmm. They can get, get big fast if your adversary uh, is losing. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in this particular case, of course, Later, the the big adversary was the Soviet Union that had uh, weapons to match our own, including the hydrogen bomb that had been developed uh, just before I came to the presidency. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yes, they managed. Uh, it, it turned out that there was uh, uh, it wasn't just the United States that was war wary, that uh, there was some flexibility that seemed to be um, present um, among uh, our enemies in that fight. And, and so an armistice was achieved. It's still in place. And I guess that's the, the last chapter of, of the Korean situation is what, what are we going to do? Um, uh, and are we going to stay, stay in Korea? Or are we going to ever, ever be mm -hmm. able to negotiate um, some kind of um, proper end of that war? Right. And uh, there was uh, one of the things he, he, another big issue that he dealt with after the war was how to deal with Germany. Um, and uh, we won't go into a lot of detail about that because, uh, well, because there's so many things to cover. But he did say something interesting, which you record in your book. He said, I, I will consider our policy towards Germany successful if 50 years later uh, it's, a, it's a thriving democracy. And in 1995, which was 50 years after he said that at the end of the war, was only a couple of years after Germany had reunited as all one country and, and certainly uh, is a thriving democracy. So 
whatever his long range strategies were, that one worked. I mean, that one's right on point. And it's amazing. Um, you know, the, the Chinese, we're told the Chinese look ahead 100 years. We're told the Russians look ahead with these things. But we, we have had presidents that have done that. Um, and you, they can't keep the policies in place if somebody takes them away. But they can set the policies in a way that they make enough sense that people continue them. And I, I think a lot of those were done. Yeah. Well, I, I just want to say that I think that um, he, of course, he was a strategic leader in, uh, during the war and as president. And I think he was always looking for sustainable strategies. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I like the idea of a sustainable strategy because it's a it's a it's a good strategy if it stays in place and meets the needs over a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. Um, so many of the things we call strategies today have uh, like a one term, um, you know, half life. And mm -hmm. uh, and then and then we have to or, you know, it can go on for longer than that, of course. But then big course corrections have to be made. And I think that actually the uh, Ike's accomplishments uh, hold up pretty well uh, over the decades. And he was playing the long game anyway mm -hmm. um, when he liberated that concentration camp. Right. And was horrified, horrified by what he saw. I mean, so shocked. He said he couldn't, he still can't find words for how he felt. And he was very articulate writer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, his first reaction is, what are people going to say in 50 years? Mm -hmm. They're going to say that the Holocaust never happened uh, unless we chronicle it now. And mm -hmm. so he sent everybody, including um, my father, into those camps to photograph it. Um, congressmen came from the United States. That was all on his on his orders. Yeah. And in order to get enough evidence that, that people, you know, he, he foresaw the, the actual future because people did do deny it. Um, but it's pretty hard with the evidence. I mean, people deny that we walked on the moon. Uh, yeah, so, true. so, so it, it, it's, it, it, he, he understood the difficulties of, of convincing human beings of anything, um, very well. And it, one of the other interesting parts about his strategies is that a really good sustainable strategy is usually one you don't have to hide. You, you exactly. usually can be transparent about those <laughs> strategies and say, this is what we're doing, and this is how we're going to do it. And, you know, I think a lot of time people uh, on, that are your enemies don't believe that's your real strategy. You must be hiding something, um, you know, as your real strategy because nobody would just do that straight up like that. But I, I think in his uh, speech to the Commonwealth Club and plenty of other ones like that, he makes it clear what the principles are and why he wants to do what he wants to do. Um, it, it you know, George, um, I, I just wanted to add here that mm -hmm. Ike knew one thing, he knew it very well from the war, and it's something for us to think about today, is that the bedrock of leadership is trust mm -hmm. between the leader and those he leads. And uh, I think that's what he was saying in the Commonwealth uh, Club speech, mm -hmm. is that, you know, the, the people don't know each other. Mm -hmm. How can they trust each other if they don't know each other, especially if they have a different point of view. And the idea of, of the middle way, which is what he called his two-term presidency, mm -hmm. was really to be a wide space where uh, those from the left and those on the right could come together in that space um, and uh, compose their differences and to compromise and to make, uh, and, and therefore make uh, progress. Mm -hmm. Maybe he wasn't um, a person who could be regarded as a, um, a radical progressive, but mm -hmm. he was a progressive. And some of his early speeches after he's elected president are really surprising for how far out on the limb he goes about uh, civil rights and, right. and other topics. But he did not believe that you'd have a sustainable strategy if there was a flip-flop between a right and a left mm -hmm. um, position. And I think that is, of course, one of the things we're dealing with today. Me, very interesting that by, by doing the straightforward strategy that you're more successful. Um, and the other element that uh, uh, we were talking about, about trust, uh, it seems to me that you have a problem in our trying to come to an agreement with each other today. Everybody has their own point of view, which has always been true. Um, we're getting used to democracy. That is, everybody gets to have their point of view. Um, some people are very mad at uh, the educated elite for trying to run things based on principles and so on and so forth. It, it, it's against the way they would want to do it. 
So you need to have a persuasive argument about it. And in addition to that, you take all the groups and you say, what is it that we have in common? I think one of the things that we've learned over the years is that, you know, it's all right if we educate women. They're not gonna, it's not going to be the end of society. In fact, our society is now better. You know, it's more productive. It's not, not bad if we educate women. All kinds of people, everybody should be educated. Although anybody who doesn't want to be educated, that's another argument. Maybe they don't need to be educated. If they don't want to, that's fine you have a certain element of what it is that we can have in common and say, if that's our goal, and we all agree, not all, but like 70% agree on those goals, then we can trust each other if we just stick to those goals. This is what we're going to work on together, and the rest of it is. And, but, but people in politics want to promise what they're going to accomplish. And, and nobody can promise what they're going to accomplish in politics because... Every, there's a whole bunch of people you have to get to agree with you. <laughs> That's true. That's absolutely true. Yeah. You know, uh, um, Eisenhower once said, I think it was uh, at the beginning of his administration when he was describing a problem, he said he described it as the fear in the hearts of men. Yeah. I think he understood that what underlies a lot of this lack of trust is fear, just to your point. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's the role of a responsible leader uh, to put into perspective. Um, the fears we may have uh, versus um, how dire things really are. And we've gotten to the point in this country now where everything's a threat. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm really sorry, but not all threats are, are equal. Yeah. And some are more important than others. Um, and I think this is uh, one thing a reader might get from this book is uh, the way a true strategist uh, thinks about these things is to understand what the fundamental Mm -hmm. questions are uh, because nobody is effective if they take on absolutely every issue but what are the ones that are going to keep what is the long pole in the tent that's going to keep the tent from collapsing right and and uh, the people who miss that don't realize that the tent pole the main tent pole is coming down uh and i, I and the <laughs> the idea about the fear is absolutely right i mean i think one of the reasons that we were successful after world war ii was the level of confidence in america look what we had just exactly. accomplished um, yes, there were big, scary things going on. The, the nuclear weapons uh, were a big, scary thing from our childhoods, as you certainly remember, and several other things. But there was still the confidence that we can meet our, our problems and overcome them because we, we overcame bigger problems already in World War II. So why can't we do these? And I think that the amount of fear that has been generated since 9-11 about this and then the next thing and the next thing... Um, even, even though, you know, there were plenty of terrorism in the 70s and 80s in Europe and America, but it wasn't, the, it, didn't, it didn't scare people as much. So I, I think... Well, that's uh, right. There's yeah. a lo certain amount of political exploitation around fear. You know, yeah. um, some people in Washington um, say that if you want to get anything uh, done on Capitol Hill or at the White House, you have to say it's a national security threat. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I have one very cynical friend who calls it threat marketing. Yeah. Um, whatever the case is, you see the early beginnings of that with the missile gap in, in the story I've written. Right. Um, and uh, it, it certainly we should be uh, vigilant and alert at all times. Uh, but we have to also understand that the state of our economy, um, the, um, <clears throat> uh, the moral authority we have as a country, both uh, domestically and internationally, all these things Eisenhower thought were critical to our own national security and, and military capability, sure, but that wasn't the only thing uh, that was part of our national security. Right, and uh, because I don't think human nature will change too much, I, I accept that the politicians will use this uh, threat marketing in order to get ahead, but what I would hope for is that they would at least do like John Kennedy did, was once he won, that he said, well, actually, that it's not as bad as we said, to, 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 right. to bring it back down again. Um, I understand this, it's just like a game. It's like, um, like trash talking in a basketball game. You're trying to upset the other person uh, so that they're not at the top of their game so that you win the game. I mean, in a way, it shows a lack of confidence that you can win the game without doing it, but uh, we won't talk about that because that's the way all games are mostly played. But it would be <laughs> nice if the politicians would then say, oh, well, I was just kidding, or not I was just kidding, but it's not, now that I'm here and I found out all the information, it's not as bad as... I said, and so we can all go back to feeling a little bit more comfortable um, because that level of fear is really the thing that dissolves 
uh, society. It's it's you just well. There's another stop. there's another fear there too, uh, which is probably contributed is 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 part of uh, the result of social media and just a whole bunch of cultural factors. Mm. Um, but people are very afraid of being seen as weak. Mm-hmm. Uh, or as a winner or a loser, mm-hmm. and and these are kind. Of, I uh, I don't think my grandfather would understand that at all. Mm-hmm. He really believed in second chances, and if you believe in second chances, then you don't believe in the whole winner loser yeah. um, uh, accusations that are hurled at people. But these are these are uh, attacks on people's uh, motives and their personalities, and I don't think it helps at all. Um, it doesn't help because then people might make. Um, ill-informed decisions just so that they are seen to be doing something when in fact spending more time um, studying the issue, uh, looking at the background and thinking about the long-term consequences would be more productive. Well, your, your grandfather certainly embodied that. One of my maxims in, in, in my writing is everyone is a loser. Winners are just losers with more patience. No, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> so we have, we have one last question. Um, here in time for it, uh, from Evans. How did he find it different to be a leader in the military versus leading in the world of politics and government? And you know, sort of which one was more difficult for him? You, you, you addressed that in your book, and I, I was very interesting. Well, I, I'm so happy for that question because um, there is no question that Dwight Eisenhower had a learning curve when he got into um, you know, full-blown retail politics. Mm -hmm. Um, First of all, one of the big differences is when you're um, a five-star general, uh, everybody, uh, you outrank everybody, Mm -hmm. right? (laughs) (laughs) um, And and the military is organized in a way to follow orders. And and, uh, I would say that, uh, and I think it's pretty evident in the book, that as a five-star general, you know, he was uh, remarkably flexible and uh, he was not like his former boss, uh, General Douglas MacArthur, who, mm. um, uh, you know, was was tough on troops and, you know, was uh, addicted to the attention he received. Um, I wanted to be the uh, un-MacArthur, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, in any case, <laughs> uh, yeah, but in any case, the um, uh, it. I think he described it during the uh, chief of staff years where he says that um, the biggest job in the military as commander or supreme commander um, is to think through how he really views things and and what his strategy is going to be and then to bring others along to lead people. Mm -hmm. Then he says, but I've noticed from being in Washington that making up your own mind on something is only just the beginning of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> and then he, and then he outlines all of the various problems there are. You know, you don't know who is connected to who and who has a grudge against who. And this, this it's, it's actually a very, very funny pa- uh, yeah. passage. And I think it's probably particularly funny because he wrote it in his, um, his uh, diary, which he never thought would get um, published for mm. all of us to read and enjoy. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, you saw some uh, early uh, hiccups in the campaign and uh, later, um, like, um, well, mostly in the campaign. Uh, but he, he, he picked up the algorithm of it pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I can just say that if we uh, don't understand um, some of those hiccups, like, um, Uh, his uh, staff releasing uh, his speech during the McCarthy encounter um, Mm -hmm. in Minnesota, then then we're missing um, the adjustment he had to make. Mm -hmm. Um, I think probably any time any leaks or any staff did not do what they were told to do, this was a big problem Mm -hmm. with him um, because it isn't what you do in the military. And uh, so he ran a tight ship in the White House Um, and, uh, believe it or not, I mean, his associates were, um, tremendously respectful of it. I I knew many of his associates and they, they liked the fact that they were given uh, a lot of leeway. Um, Mm -hmm. he was a very good person at delegating. Um, uh, but they understood that they had to be personally responsible for the decisions they were making too. Mm -hmm. I should add to that, of course, is that Eisenhower had a pretty good sense of, who needed the short reins and who he could give uh, more latitude to. 
But it's a fascinating question. And thank you so much for asking it because we tend to study Eisenhower the president or we study Eisenhower the general, but we don't really put the two of them together as much as we should because uh, this adjustment uh, was a real one starting with his role as chief of staff of the army <laughs> yeah. and going on from there. The people skills of dealing with so many different kinds of generals, you know, in, including the, the the really big ego tests that he had to deal with uh, in, in Patton and, and Douglas MacArthur, who used to be his boss. I mean, that's one thing. But with politicians, he, he, you know, he had to learn a whole new set of buttons to push or whatever to understand <laughs> these people. You know, what drives them? Certainly not truth. Certainly not trying to win a war. You know, win election. Yes. Well, I can kind of trans. But anyway, I, I thought you did a, a wonderful job of showing both sides of that. And it's a great book for those of you. Uh, want much more detail, get it, and enjoy it. And uh, I'm sorry that you're all at home and have time to read it, but, but there it is. It's going to be a great idea for anybody that wants to go back to that period of time. So thank you very much, Susan, for uh, you know, explaining your book and, and, and the great uh, pictures of your grandfather and, and of yourself from your childhood. And so ends another event of the Commonwealth Club in its 118th year of enlightened discussion. Thank you, George. My pleasure, Susan. That was great.